the supply chain was breaking down before COVID. Now, of course, COVID made it worse, yes. Uh, and the war in Ukraine made it worse, yes. But this really started with Trump's trade war in 2018. That, like I said, there's a thread that runs through all these things. So not to throw out my hands, I'm not going to do that. But when you ask me that, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm talking about China, Ukraine, supply chain, Biden, they're all a big deal. You know, in terms of tragedy, probably the war in Ukraine is the most important because it's highly, highly significant economically and strategically. But of course, it's a human tragedy going with it. You know, if Chinese real estate implodes, okay, there's some hardship here and there, but it's not like people being killed or maimed or forced into refugee status. And that is part of what's going on in Ukraine. So that's a that's probably the biggest single one, but I wouldn't miss the fact that all these things are going on at once. The number one question, uh, of course, everyone's concerned about inflation, but there's a big backstory there. But I always say, when it comes to your own money, everybody has a PhD in economics. You don't need Larry Summers to tell you what's going on with your budget and your you know, ability to feed your family or keep a roof over your head. So people get inflation. One of the reasons it's so politically toxic is because it's unavoidable. You can't fudge it. You can't spin it. It's like, hey, if I used to fill up my Ford F-150 truck for 50 bucks, and now it's 125 bucks, A, you get it. It's right in your face. And B, that's 75 bucks that you don't have to take your spouse out to dinner, you know, buy a new jacket or whatever. So there's kind of demand destruction at the same time you're spending more money on the one thing you can't do without. So people get it. But then from there, the question I get the most is, hey, Jim, is this going to cause a recession? Are we going to have a recession? And as recently as a few months ago, I would say, yeah, I think so. You can see it coming late this year, early next year. Now I say we're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. And there's data. I, you know, I never make statements like that, Brian, without supporting it. So the standard definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. There are a few more bells and whistles having to do with unemployment and a few other things, but that's the rule of thumb. So based on that, based on the best available estimate for a second quarter, likely to be accurate, we're in a recession today. Now, it's not severe, but that's like saying, you know, I'm in bed with a, you know, pneumonia, but I'm not dying. Well, okay, but uh, we're in a recession right now. Um, and there's a lot of whistling past the graveyard. I mean, the stock market is still you know, greatly overpriced. There's still, you know, the buy the dips mentality hasn't gone away. It's still there. You got people like Jim Cramer yelling, you know, buy Netflix or whatever. And, uh, you know, there's institutional support. There's momentum trading. Of course, 95% of the trading is by robots. So you got to reverse engineer the 27 year olds from Bangladesh who don't get out much. They're the ones really writing these algorithms. I mean, brilliant engineers, but, you know, you'd have to show them around Wall Street. So all that's going on. So we haven't really seen the real, the market collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out. It'll get worse as the year goes on. All right. So you're expecting a major correction in stock markets on yeah, the back I'm of not recession. alone. I mean, that is my expectation. I have my own models and I look at it closely. But if you listen to you know, Michael Berry, Jeremy Grantham, uh, you know, Charlie Munger, these people have been around and they run, you know, hundreds of billions and uh, they're saying the same thing. So every now and then someone will throw some statistic at me. And I go, well, how long is your time series? And I go, oh, we took it back five years. I was like, you know, talk to me if you've done it for a hundred years, because that's a little more meaningful. But Jeremy Grantham actually did do a 100 year time series and looked at bubbles all over the world, you know, 1929, US, 1989, Japan, 2000, dot com stocks, you know, and many others. And he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, it's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's real estate, stocks, and other asset classes. So, uh, yeah, I do, that is my view, but it's shared by a number of other analysts. And that would mean like S&P coming off another 20, 30 percent? Yes. And again, you have to remind people, 1929, everyone's like, yeah, October, uh, I think the 18th or 19th, it was late October 1929, the stock market fell 22 percent in two days. It wasn't one day, it was, you know, it was like 12 percent one day, 11 percent the next day, so 23 percent over two days. But that wasn't the crash. I mean, that was the beginning of the crash. This Dow Jones fell 82 percent from top to bottom. Now it took three years. It bottomed in uh, June 1932, started in October 1929, so not quite three years, but that fell 82%. 
And that happens. So, uh, yeah, we're down, uh, you know, NASDAQ's down, uh, bounced back a little bit in recent days, down close to 30%, down the S&P, down over 20%. We're in bear market territory, but that's just the beginning. That's not what a full bear market, full, you know, market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that I expect. Talk to me about inflation, because, you know, I was looking at some of the inflation numbers and you have to go back to the 80s to see anything that's approaching double digit. You know, I remember being just a kid hearing about double digit inflation. I could kind of remember the gas pumps, you know, the lines at the gas. It's like a distant memory of me in the 70s. And but, you know, how do you talk to younger people these days about what inflation is or it means? Because I don't think people really grasp what it actually means to your savings or to the economy in an, even a medium term. That's exactly right, Brian. And if you, um, you're a little younger than I am, but I lived through it. I was started my career in banking in 1976. And I remember my, uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising. I was in banking and the inflation was so bad. You'd get a raise every like four or five months. And you didn't have to ask. They would just give it to you because they knew that you were going to quit if they didn't keep up. So she would get a raise and she was making more than I was at the time. So we'd go out to dinner and, and I would get a raise and I was making more than she was. So we would just tease each other about that. But that's how it was. And the psychology was, you know, if you needed a whatever, you know, a TV set or refrigerator, new car, whatever, you say, I better buy it now because the price is going to be higher. If I wait a month or two months, the price is going to run away from me. So it had huge behavioral effects. Of course, gold was, you know, Know, going to the moon. There was a lot going on at the time. But Brian, you're right when you say we're putting up inflation numbers today that are the highest in 40 years. That is correct. A little 41. Actually, it was 1981 before we saw these numbers. But I remind people, the inflation in 1981 was the end of a 10-year period of inflation. It wasn't the beginning. It's like, oh, that's some inflation in 1981. Yeah, we did. But it had started. I mean, in some ways, it started in 1968 and it really took off in 1974, 75. So 81, these numbers, that was when Volcker finally got it under control. But you go back to 80, you know, 70, we do well, between 77 and 81, so that five-year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power, not 15, 50 in that five-year stretch. So you were putting up numbers, you know, 10%, 11%, 13% and higher year after year. Yeah, 1981, it was, um, you know, nine or 10, which is what they're comparing to today. But that was on the downslope. It had been higher than that in 77, 78, and, you know, 79. So the question is, is this the beginning of an inflationary surge where it's going to get even worse and it is going to last five years? Or is it different than that? But keep that in mind because the 40 year comparison, it is correct, but that was the tail end of an even worse episode. And again, there is this comparison to the 70s. By the way, I think the situation we're in today is very different from the 1970s. And I'll explain why. In the 70s, it was triggered from the supply side with first the Arab oil embargo in 1973 as a result of the, uh, the 1973 Arab-Israeli war. And then the price tripled, but it went from like $2 to $6. Okay. But, you know, percentage terms, that's a huge jump, but it was still $6. And then it got to 12 And then in 1979, you had a second oil embargo because of Iran and the Ayatollah and the revolution and the hostages and all that. And then it went from kind of 12 to 20 So oil went up by a factor of 10 in the course of the late 70s because of those two different embargoes. So that's coming from the supply side. But what happened was the other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off or there's an embargo or there's a shortage, of natural disaster, a lot of things. It's coming from the supply side and demand is inelastic. So you just pay up or you know kind of do without. But the demand side is much more psychological. That's called demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described. And as I said, I lived through the 70s, um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So as that applies to today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course, they're related. You know, it's like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? To get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Oh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. 
you need diesel in your tractors, you get the food, you got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That requires diesel. The higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. But food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without, like, you know, we got through 1998, we got through the dot com crash, we got through 2008, we got through 2020 and COVID. Uh, there's a, actually a good size uh, market drawdown in 2018 between October 1st, 2018, uh, and Christmas Eve, what I call the Christmas Eve massacre. Stock markets dropped 20% in, uh, in under three months. Uh, when the Fed kept raising interest rates, even though the economy was weakening. So they have seen those, but every single time it came back, even in COVID, uh, March, April, 2020, the stock market went down 30%. It did, I mean, just almost straight down. But by September, we were back to new all-time highs. And so it's not that they've never seen that kind of volatility, but they learned the wrong lesson, which is it always comes back. And we know why, because the Fed bails you out, the Fed floods the zone with money, the Fed talks it up, you know, et cetera. But the, the counter example, 1929, when the stock market did crash, it was down 23% over two days. It was like a 12% day and an 11% day in uh, late October, 1929 but it kept going. <laughs> the stock market crashed in October, 1929, but it bottomed in June, 1932. That was a three year moving crash or rolling crash, whatever you want to call it, with some rallies along the way. And the total uh, damage was over 80%, not 30%, not 40%, down 80%. And what people don't know, uh, many people don't know, is you said, okay, you know, then, then it rallied in 1933 and 1934. The Fed messed up again and blundered again, as they usually do in 1937, and threw us into a double dip. But if you ask people, okay, well, everyone knows the stock market crashed in 1929. When did it regain those highs? How long did that take? The answer is 25 years. It was 1954 before right. the market recovered from 1929. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't gains along the way or you couldn't make money, you could. But if you say, oh, I'll just sit tight and wait till it comes back. Well, a lot of people didn't live long enough. They never saw their, their money back because they didn't live 25 more years. So that's a real bear market. It's happened before. And the, the point is uh, you need to be prepared for things like that. And there are no one alive, but very few people alive have have seen anything like that. And if you say, well, what if we had another market crash right now? We'll talk about reasons why in a second. Um, why could the Fed just come right back in and you know print some more money and do the same thing over again and bail out the new failures, whoever they may be? Yeah, you, know, you can just kind of keep bailing things out. Why not do it again? You know, what's the what's the big deal? Well, the answer is each bailout is bigger than the one before. And that's the point. You can go all the way back 1994, Mexico, 1998, Russia, LTCM, 2000, dot com, 2008, Lehman, 2020, pandemic. And they do bail out, but each one's bigger than the one before. I mean, we threw out six or seven trillion dollars of new debt on top of a one trillion dollar a year baseline, seven trillion dollars in new debt to kind of dig our way out of uh, of 2020. So there is a there is a limit. There comes a time it's like, hey, this this bail is going to be 20 trillion you know sorry that's uh, that check's too big we're gonna have to let some things fail so what could happen um the the first thing on my list is uh we're heading for a very uh severe recession i just want to uh, kind of explain briefly the dynamics of that so the fed's raising interest rates we know that they started you know it, so it wasn't that long ago but march 1st 2022 the fed policy rate was zero it was zero percent uh, people remember Paul Volcker. Oh, Paul Volcker raised interest rates to 20%. Well, he did, but so far Powell hasn't raised them as high, but he's raised them fast. I mean, even when Volcker was working his way to 20%, it took three years from 1979 to 1982. So Powell's plan is clear because he's told us. He said inflation is job one. You know, it's not that we don't care, but unemployment is going to go up. We're going to have a recession. He doesn't use the R word, by the way, but it's implicit in everything he says. We are going to have a recession. Unemployment is going up. And too bad. It's kind of too bad because we got to get inflation under control. And so the Fed is in search of something that they call the terminal rate. What's the terminal rate? The terminal rate is a rate that's high enough to bring inflation down on its own without further hikes. So it doesn't have to be higher than inflation. It has to be high enough 
to cause inflation to come down to the Fed's goal of 2% without hiking more. And when they get there to that terminal rate, they'll sit tight, they call it the pause. And the pause could be a year. And Powell said this, again, this is right out of his script. So um, Powell's in search of the terminal rate. By the way, if you said to me, hey Jim, what's the terminal rate? I would answer truthfully, I would say, I don't know, but neither does Jay Powell. Jay Powell doesn't know what the terminal rate is. He's, he's kind of saying, we'll know it when we see it, but we're not there yet and we're gonna keep going. And um, they, they have what they call the DOTS, silly name, but the members of the Board of Governors and the Federal Reserve Bank presidents give estimates or the, you know, their estimates of unemployment, inflation, growth, and interest rates for the next three years. Uh, and they put them as dots on a chart, so they call it the dots. Uh, and then, you know, Wall Street gets the dots, they do a central tendency and regressions and all this stuff. One of the top Fed insiders, like practically sits in Jay Powell's lap and has all the way back to Bernanke and Yellen, told me personally, he said, inside the Fed, they regard the dots as a joke. They're not better than guesses. Their forecasting ability is dismal. You or I would have better forecasts. And they wish they could get out of it, but they don't know how. So that's the truth, but the problem is, Wall Street and the financial media and the talking heads on CNBC, they want to talk about the dots and it does affect market behavior. So even though it's a joke, even though the forecasts are terrible, you have to pay attention because it affects the markets. And if you're affecting the markets, you're on the wrong side, you're going to get run over. So I look at the dots, not because I put weight on them as predictive analytic tools, but because the market pays attention. The market says, hey, inflation is already coming down. And so the market says, hey, you did it. You're, you know, you're already there. Inflation is coming down. Why don't you stop? And by the way, you're going to get the message. The economy is going to be slowing down. Inflation is going to be coming down. And then you're going to cut rates. This is the famous pivot. Whenever you hear of the Fed pivot, that's when the Fed turns around and starts cutting rates instead of raising them. And that'll be just in time and growth will slow, but it won't be too bad. And we'll come in for soft landing. And this is the Goldilocks scenario. Uh, so again, typical Wall Street, get the pom-poms out, the Fed's going to cut rates, and so buy stocks. That's all Wall Street knows is buy stocks. But the conundrum is, is inflation coming down because the Fed is still hiking, or is the inflation coming down because they're at the terminal rate? Well, we don't know. It's kind of hard to sort those things out. Powell would say, yeah, it's coming down. I know that, of course, but I got it's, it's because I'm hiking and I'm going to keep doing it. My view is, no, you're, you actually did it. It's mission accomplished. You just don't know it. That means, as usual, they're going to screw it up. They're going to blunder. They're going to go too far. And it's not going to be a mild recession. It's not going to be Goldilocks. In this version, Goldilocks gets eaten by the bears. In other words, you're going to throw this economy into a very deep recession because you're going to go too far, as usual. And you're not going to know it until too, too late. By the time you realize You've, it's mission accomplished, you will have gone too far, too long, rates are going to be too high, and it's not going to be a soft landing. If Wall Street's talking up the stock market based on the soft landing Goldilocks scenario, but Powell's going to stick to his guns and, and, and raise rates too high, that's going to cause stocks to crash very severely, very suddenly. If, if the market were adjusting, say, yeah, Powell means it, uh, he's going to keep it, man, we ought to come down a little bit, that would be one thing, but that's not what's happening. The market's trying to rally, Powell's warning people what's going to happen they're not listening and it is going to happen it's going to get worse inflation is here to stay um commodities are going to boom oil prices are going to soar bonds are going to crash and gold has been in a very funny situation which is the following normally you say well if there's inflation coming why isn't the price of gold going to the moon and why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all 5, 10, sometimes 20-year decisions. The 10-year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative for August of 2020 is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, 
the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10-year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets, and I start my analysis in 1971, and I don't have to go through all, all that data, but that's, that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s earlier through most of the 19th century. For the United States and sterling, I think it was $4.75. It could be off a little bit on that, but you know, four, four pounds and, and change. And as late as World War I, say 1913, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to you know, at the time Bombay, today Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. British sovereign is it's about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce; it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today, what are you going to do with a one ounce coin? It's worth you know almost two thousand uh, dollars. You know, you're not going to use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time. And it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign? That's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971, when we decoupled completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3,000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Whether it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. So that's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve System told all the banks, hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and you know hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and it's there. And look on the, look in the assets and the first line item is gold certificate, and it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that that 11 billion is actually worth 
70 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of 450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet represented by a gold certificate. But it's not the gold. The Treasury has the gold. And by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, you know, I just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hit it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it, and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously. In the U.S., we still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half, no, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. If I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it an ounce since 1980. I'd rather be the U.S. than China. China's in even worse shape for different reasons. Um, it's not so much interest rate policy, although they're they're subject to global interest rate policy and exchange rates coming from the Fed. But uh, you can see it in real estate. It's a full-scale collapse. Uh, they're, they're propping it up, but, um, the, the, the buyers aren't interested. In other words, the, the Chinese government is telling the banks to lend money to real estate developers who can't finish housing. Well, that sounds good. It's like, okay, here's some money, finish the housing. But the buyers are not flocking in. The buyers have been burned. They're shying away from that asset class. They want to increase cash. They're looking at other asset classes. They don't have a lot of choices because, China has very strict capital controls. They're trying to get their money out by means legal and illegal. Uh, they're buying gold when they can. Um, but uh, as I say, they may not have a lot of choices, but even money in the bank looks pretty good compared to what's going on in real estate. The problem is too big. The bubble is too large. It's gone on for too long. We don't hear about it the same way we did about the Japanese real estate bubble in 1989, 1990. That was an epic crash. Uh, Japan is still not recovered. I remember in the 90s, Early 2000s, they talked about the lost decade. Well, try three lost decades. That's going into a fourth. Uh, that's Japan. You know, eight or I've lost count. Actually, eight or nine recessions since 1989. But it's really just one long depression. That's the way to understand the Japanese economy. China's going into something like that. We don't hear much about it because they're not transparent. They lie about their numbers. You you need to look at private sources and other use other, other analytic tools to understand what's going on there. Uh, but they've got um, you know, drops in consumption, industrial output, real estate's collapsing, uh, their price indices are collapsing, all this infl- fear of inflation. It's been around, it's real, but it's now turning around very quickly. And you can see that in China. China's gone through something that the world has never seen. Uh, it is a, they're going to lose 600 million people in the next 50 to 70 years. This is a demographic implosion. This is worse than the Black Death. Of course, the Black Death uh, killed somewhere between a third and half the population of Europe in the uh, 14th century. Um, uh, it was a good time for uh, for labor, by the way. Uh, the you know the labor was so scarce that returns to labor went up versus returns to capital uh, because there weren't enough workers. Uh, but that's the only thing uh, that can come close. Even the uh, you know the Spanish flu of 1919 killed about no no one's certain of the number, but but between 100 million and maybe over 200 million people. The Thirty Years' War was certainly you know in the early 17th century was certainly 
highly destructive. But what's going on in China now is, is worse than any of those things. Um, it, you know, has to do with math, you know, simple demographic math. Uh, the key number is 2.1. Two people have to produce 2.1 children, a you know, man and a woman, or you can say per woman, if you, if you want, uh, have to produce 2.1 children to keep the population constant. Why not two? Why not two producing two? The answer is infant mortality and those who don't make it to, uh, adulthood and can continue the, uh, repopulation of the planet, uh, if you will. But they're not even close to that. They're well below two. And by the way, so is, so is the rest of the world. So is Australia and the US and Western Europe and a lot of other places. This is a global phenomenon, but it's particularly acute in China. Maybe the case that China's, uh, replacement rate is, uh, or, or birth rate is actually one. Uh, it has to be 2.1 to maintain. It could be one or lower. Uh, this is a, a demographic implosion, unlike anything ever seen, uh, anyone's ever seen. It also has a dynamic. You can't reverse it very quickly. It, it feeds on itself as I was talking about inflation earlier. So, uh, this is going to continue for 50 to 75 years. Uh, they're going to lose 600 million people. There are a lot of definitions of GDP, uh, four or five part definition. They're more complex calculations, but there's one really simple definition that only has two factors, population and productivity. How many people are working and how productive are they? That's nominal GDP. It's, that's one definition of gross GDP uh, or, or nominal uh, GDP. Well, if your population is dropping from 1.4 billion to 800 million, you're losing 600 million people. Uh, and then what about productivity? Well, the other thing that's going on is China's population is aging very quickly. So you get a population set people in the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, with very large amounts of um, cognitive decline, dementia. Uh, obviously, there's no productivity there, but it's worse than that because then you look at the shrinking population between the ages of 25 and 54. It's called their prime working age. More and more of those people are going to have to be involved in elder care. They're going to have to be basically caretakers or caregivers for the older population I described. A very worthy job, but not one that lends itself to productivity gains. Um, bathing hasn't changed in about 5,000 years. Robots don't do best. Um, the only real innovation in bathing in uh, between 1870 and 1940, we did see the rise of indoor plumbing and hot water. That's good. Um, I, I enjoy both, but um, but that's it. We, I can't think of any other bathing innovations uh, in, in the last several millennia. So if you have a shrinking working age population, a rising older population, high degree of cognitive decline, and a big slice of the working age population having to provide elder care or be caregivers for the older population, tell me where your industrial output's coming from. Tell me where your productivity is coming from. And uh, sorry if I mentioned this already, but 50% of the water in China is poisoned uh, because of, you know, just their industrial practices. You know, they, they uh, if you're a gold miner in Australia, I've invested gold mines around the world. I know that places like Canada, the U S and uh, Australia, if you use cyanide, to leach the gold, and that's a very common technique. You have to account for every, you know, microgram. You, you know, whatever you put in, you got to take out, weigh it, dispose of it properly. In China, they just dump it into the rivers, and so the rivers are poison. Um, so China is uh, uh, an economic, demographic, industrial, moral, religious uh, wasteland, and uh, will suffer. It's it's already in a recession. Just to just to cut to the chase. Again, they lie about their statistics. So, so here you have the two largest economies in the world, U.S. and China. U.S. is slowly going into what I expect will be a severe recession. China is in a century-long decline, uh, unlike one that the world has ever seen. Um, that could eventually lead to social unrest and a regime change, but let's not count on that in the short run. Just expect China to um, to shrink and become more autarkic, decoupled from the Western world, and uh, certainly not be a, a source of growth. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the largest and most sophisticated semiconductor manufacturing in the world, and semiconductors are in everything. It's not just computers. There are 1,400 semiconductors in an automobile. Uh, there's a semiconductor or more in your, your dishwasher, your refrigerator, your washing machine. They're everywhere. Internet of things. We all understand that. Um, so TSMC based in Taiwan. Uh, the United States has a military doctrine called the broken nest theory. And what it says is that if China, well, it comes from a Chinese proverb, ironically, and it says, if the nest is broken, how can the eggs survive? 
Um, and what it means is that if China invades Taiwan, and I'm not forecasting an invasion, could happen though, um, we or the Taiwanese will very quickly destroy all the semiconductor manufacturers in Taiwan. We'll just blow them up. And China won't get anything. They'll have the broken nest. Taiwan Semiconductor knows this. Um, they talk to the U.S. intelligence and military. I spent a lot of time on the Fed. And the question is, okay, what about June? They got, you know, six more meetings this year. So here's the Fed's dilemma, and it, it's playing out in real time. So Jay Powell gave, I lost count, seven or eight speeches, and they said the same thing every time. He said, inflation is job one. We're on a path to raise interest rates. We're not going to quit until inflation is under control. Now, there's a little wiggle room around that. Their target is two. They actually look at personal consumption expenditure year over year, core. That's their metric. There are 15 ways to measure inflation, but that's the one they like. But even that is still over close to five. It's a long way from two. That's the point. You're trying to get to two. They're a long way from two. But there's something called the terminal rate. What's the terminal rate? Well, no one knows the number. I don't know because Jay Powell doesn't know. So we're all estimating. But um, the terminal rate, it's a rate that's high enough to bring down inflation on its own without further rate hikes. Knows we can stop here and confident that inflation is going to come down without doing more. Because the conundrum is, okay, they've been raising rates since March 2022. Monetary policy works with a lag. Inflation peaked in July 2022, and it has been coming down ever since. You know, some of the some months were, you know, January was hot compared to December, but the trend has been down. So they're raising rates and inflation is coming down. So that's good. But here's what they don't know. Was inflation coming down because they were raising rates or had they already hit the terminal rate and they just didn't know it because Wall Street was like, no, you've hit the terminal rate. Stop, please stop. You got this under control. The Fed doesn't believe that. One of the greatest blunders in monetary policy was Paul Volcker in 1980, who had started raising rates in 1979 and inflation was coming down. But then in 1980, we had a very sharp recession that had nothing to do with monetary policy. It wasn't caused by Paul Volcker. Jimmy Carter put a cap on credit card interest and everyone banks stopped issuing credit cards. Well, that'll that'll sink the economy. And then so Volcker reacted to that by lowering interest rates seven percentage points, not 70 basis points, seven percentage points, because we're in a recession, right? That's what feds do, the Fed shares do. But because it was a regulatory blunder, they fixed it and the economy came roaring back and then inflation really took off worse than when Volcker got in in 79, early 1980. So Volcker had to take raise to 20% to get inflation under control the second time after cutting them in 1980. And that's called the Volcker mistake or the Volcker blunder. And Volcker himself, I spoke to him, he said, yeah, that was that was a mistake that I should have stuck. I should have stuck to my program, not worried about the economy and unemployment, but just got inflation under control. But when he threw in the towel prematurely, the inflation went to the moon. Jay Powell doesn't want to be that guy. Jay Powell knows that episode as well as I do. And he doesn't want to be the guy who throws in the towel early and then inflation just goes to the moon and then he's got it. Then he has to take interest rates to 15 percent or something ridiculous. So Wall Street's saying you're already there. Mission accomplished. Pal saying not so fast. They told Volcker that and he cut rates and it was an enormous mistake. So Pal's not going to be that guy. So what is the terminal rate today? I would say five and a half because we had we had a lot of hot data, you know, unemployment down, uh, job creation up, retail sales up, not to the moon, but these are the opposite of what Powell is looking for. So he's had no confirmation that inflation is coming down on his own. He's had a lot of data that says inflation may be getting ready to take off again. So you got to say the terminal rate went from five and a quarter to five and a half, maybe more. Let's you know see what he does in June. And Powell always said, I don't care if there's a recession. I don't care if there's unemployment because the long-term costs of inflation are going to be much greater than those short-term problems. We got to suffer through that to get a bigger problem under control. He thinks of inflation. He said this many, many times. Now, along comes Silicon Valley Bank. Okay. Oh, by the way, in addition to raising rates, don't forget QT, quantitative tightening. They were shrinking their balance sheet. It's very hard to estimate the monetary impact of shrinking the balance sheet, but the best estimate is for every trillion dollars you take it down, it's probably equal to a one percentage point hike in the Fed funds rate. So the tightening has been more than just taking the Fed funds rate up. You also have to take into account QT. Now let's go back to the, the bond, the bond guarantee and bailing out the entire banking system. The Fed proceeded to guarantee every deposit and every bank in the entire U.S. banking system. We were talking, you know, six or seven trillion dollars of assets. 
And the way they did it was um, a lot of other banks, you know, big ones and small ones, at least the big ones had good risk management, but a lot of small and medium sized banks, they had the same problem Silicon Valley Bank had. Maybe the depositors weren't work, walking out the door, or maybe they weren't funding tech startups, but they had underwater bonds and overnight deposits and were facing the same thing. So the Fed said, okay, all you banks, if you send us your bonds, we'll give you cash. Okay, that's just a normal discount operation, but that will give you cash equivalent to the par value. So again, remember the market value is like 80 cents on the dollar, but the Fed says we'll give you 100 cents on the dollar. So now you ship your bonds to the Fed, they give you not 100%, which is like low collateral, but they give you 120%. So the banks are shipping in bonds that are worth 80 cents on the dollar. Why wouldn't you do that? I'm like, hey, hey, Fed, if you want to give me a low, low interest rate bridge loan uh, with 80% down, I'll take all you got. So now, the banks are going to are going to do that. And by the way, there's no, because it's structured kind of like a repurchase agreement. There's no sale, so they don't have to market to market. If you sold it to a third party, a dealer, you would. You'd have to take the loss. But now they don't have to take the loss. So they're shipping in billions, and potentially a trillion dollars or more of these bonds. They're not getting 80, 90 cents on the dollar, which is what they're worth. They're getting a hundred cents on the dollar, which was the original purchase price. They don't have to take the loss, and they're getting cash. Why wouldn't you do that all day long? So in effect, they bailed out the entire banking system to the tune of trillions of dollars. They just blew up the $250,000 limit. Forget that. I mean, I know what the statute says, but they threw that out the window. And uh, the, the moral hazard, the economic consequences, the repercussions of this are kind of unimaginable. I mean, I can sketch them. I can talk about them. You know, to hear Johnny Hill say it's not a bailout. Are you kidding me? This is the biggest bailout in history. And I, you know, I, I negotiated the LTCM bailout. I, I lived through that. That was a trillion dollars of derivatives. Uh, and through 2008, 2020, the pandemic, I go back to 1994, the Mexican tequila crisis. I've, I've lived through all these and been more or less directly involved in all of them. And this is orders of magnitude greater in terms of what's being bailed out. Doesn't that mean that a lot of banks will be sending the bonds to the Fed and getting cash? Yeah, that's exactly what it means. Well, where's the cash come from? You got to print it. So on the one hand, we're doing quantitative tightening by letting bonds mature and not reinvesting. But on the other hand, you just send an open invitation, open party, house party to every bank in the country saying, send us your bonds and we'll give you cash. Not only that, but 100 cents on the dollar, even if they're worth 80. So, so you're going to have potentially trillions of dollars of new money being printed at a time when the Fed's trying to get inflation under control and they were trying to shrink the balance sheet. They're going to be expanding the balance sheet. So, I mean, there's no way out. There's no good way out of this. Sh you can pause. Uh, I don't think they will, but you could pause and not raise rates, right? And implicitly saying we're not going to raise rates for the foreseeable future because we got all these losses in the banks. Okay, inflation goes to the moon. I promise you it'll just take off like a rocket. Or you can raise interest rates 25 basis points and we'll continue this war on inflation, but you're just going to increase the bond losses in the banks and make them send you more bonds and get more cash. Or the third thing is just take away the, the umbrella and let all these banks fail. I mean, it's like name your poison, name your poison. You can have runaway inflation, severe acute banking crisis, or basically a lot more, as I say, a lot more bank failures uh, and, and a severe recession because you're going to keep raising rates. There are three choices, but none of them are good. Inflation is coming down, by the way. And uh, having said that, the target is 2%. So he's, he's not there, but he's making progress. Now, Wall Street's saying, you're done. You, you, you did it. Mission accomplished. Inflation is coming down. You got what you want to give it time. Stop raising rates. You're going to kill the economy. But the Fed is saying, well, we actually don't know. We can't untangle it. Yes, inflation is coming down. That's subjective. But is it coming down because we're still raising rates or is it coming down because we're at the terminal rate? Those are two different things. And right now, and this is what Powell's been saying, the Fed leans to the view that they're not at the terminal rate, that inflation is coming down because they're raising rates. They have not achieved the terminal rate. So my expectation is the Fed will raise interest rates 25 basis points in March. March 22nd is the Fed meeting after that. That'll get you to five and a quarter. And even the hawk, more hawkish members think that that's probably the terminal rate. So Powell and the Fed have said, yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate, probably two more hikes, and then we'll pause 
And then if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff. I mean, the Fed's thinking mid 2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street and I'll say markets, not just Wall Street, but the big money in places like uh, the euro dollar futures curve and, and the U.S. Treasury curve, which are highly inverted, are saying no. You're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause, going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. And you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street, with the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message. Why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. And everyone knows, you know, Volcker became Fed chairman in 1979. He, he stayed on until the um, early to mid 80s. Uh, and he did raise interest rates to 20% or very close to it to kill inflation, which went up to 15% uh, at the time. But people forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp, but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the, with the uh, pandemic panic. Uh, and then they said, oh, sorry, just kidding. And then, and then, uh, they took the ceiling off and then things got back to normal. Now, this was a time when farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building. And one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That, I mean, that all happened. So, uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker, uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which number one was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, he, he said, we, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember, Powell's not an economist. He's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that, you know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, before the battle against inflation is won. Because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger, and then you do have to destroy the economy, as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then, but at the time that was horrific. But Volcker and others have said that was a blunder he never should have done. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. So so the question is, how does this play out? In my view, Powell probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat. At least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't. But the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, if you want to forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed. You have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest. The unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. You know, as I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. They think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year. There are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is, it is coming down, but there are two sources of inflation. 
and it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. Both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Now, and again, this is what my book Sold Out is about, the breakdown of the supply chain, partly related to energy, partly related to the war in Ukraine, partly related to the pandemic panic. Uh, as I explained in the book, it actually predates that. The breakdown started in 2018 with Trump's trade war. And then COVID made it worse, yes. Ukrainian war made it worse, yes. But it, it really started before that. So, of course, prices went up and people were trying to pay whatever they had to to get what they needed. And energy prices were a big driver of that. So that feeds through as a form of inflation. The other kind of inflation is from the demand side. So the supply side is called cost push. Costs go up and they push it onto the consumers. The other kind is from the demand side. It's called demand pull. And basically, consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. And so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side, but by the late 70s, 80s, in Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, but it hasn't happened yet. Here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. So it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if I'm right, I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. So it it does tend to depress um, demand, destroy demand, and hurt the economy. Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less, that we know of. And they may have several thousand tons off the books in the State Administration of Foreign Exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. When you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. What I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third-party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets, so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the rupee aren't going to replace anything. Well, the repercussions may be felt for 10 years or longer, uh, but the the, uh, the immediate impact is going to go well beyond um, uh, you know the so-called sanctions. What the point I was really making was, we're slapping sanctions on Russia. Russia is hitting back with some retaliatory actions, uh, and it's pretty easy to to look at the direct impact of that. But there's second order and third order effects that will pop up all over the world and could very quickly get out of control. They think of it as the economic equivalent of a nuclear war. Nobody wants a nuclear war. But the, they, the, the one thing they all said in common, the one thing they all shared was, don't go there. And what they meant was that nobody wakes up and says, oh, gee, I think I'll start a nuclear war today. What a good idea. That, that never happens. What does happen is you get into an escalatory situation, back and forth and back and forth, where you're escalating and escalating, and you end up in a nuclear war. You never intended it, never started out that way. But you end up there through escalation. Now take that, and that, that, that is good analysis. Take that, 
and apply it to what is now, I would say, the first full-scale economic war, uh, sanctions war. We've had sanctions, you know, for a long time, and we go back to the at least the 70s with with Iran, but even before that, I mean, FDR put sanctions on Japan. Nothing on this scale. This is uh, unprecedented in its scope and application. Uh, and my only point is, it, it, the effects of this are going to not just last a long time. Yes. But they're going to pop up in very, very unexpected places. Um, I, I did. It, uh, let me make. The, let me make the point. This was. Uh, there was never a war that was easier to prevent. There was, there's never been a war that's easier to prevent, and there's never been a war that's easier to end. Uh, the, you could end this war in 48 hours or less. Uh, having said that, I did expect that through a series of policy blunders and escalation, in this case military escalation and political escalation. And then later in the book, around on page 250 or so, I have a whole section on Ukraine, Russia, and natural gas. So this has been brewing for a long time. Um, you can go back to the 2008 Bucharest Declaration, but if you, if you want to pick one thing and say, hey, when, when did this thing take a turn for the worse? Right. So that we were on a path to war. That was the color revolution sponsored by Obama and Biden. Um, which was a coup d'etat. I mean, the, the president of Ukraine at the time, he was pro-Russian, and Obama set out to depose him, and they did. And they put in Poroshenko, who was a U.S. puppet, and at the same time, like a month, well, two months after the color revolution, one month before Poroshenko, uh, Putin took Crimea. He said, okay, that's how you want to play, fine. Uh, you, throw, you move away from neutrality, move towards NATO, NATO, I'll take Crimea, your move. And then there was nothing to... Putin didn't take one square inch during the Trump administration, because Trump is, Trump is highly unpredictable, but put Biden back in, who was part of the original Obama-Biden team. And so not only was Trump not in Putin's pocket, uh, he was the only one who stood up to Putin in such a way that Putin didn't take one square inch of territory. He took Crimea under Obama. Now he's taking kind of half the country under Biden. Didn't take anything under Trump. So that completely debunks that. But just to take it one step further, who is in the pocket of um, of the of the Ukrainians, at least? And the answer is Joe Biden, because of Hunter Biden, who made millions of dollars from Burisma, the large natural gas company. Ukraine is ranked uh, in the low 90s of the of the most corrupt countries in the world. In other words, the it's at the bottom on a corruption list with the best with the, with the most honest countries being on top. Um, Ukraine is very close to the bottom. It's it's the most corrupt country in Europe, one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Zelensky is just another oligarch, just another phony. Uh, now, you can take sides, but to me, Putin's a dictator, Zelensky's a dictator. You know, pick your dictator. But um, this idea that he's some, you know, good guy Democrat is nonsense. Well, it's a phone call, basically. I mean, Biden, uh, Biden's kind of non compass but somebody with uh, who can, you know, string a few sentences together needs to call Zelensky and say, um, here's what we're going to do. You, you're not going to join NATO. Well, we'll get the, the NATO Secretary General, John, John Stoltenberg, uh, to say that. You need to say it. And the U.S. will say it. So you're not going to join NATO. You're not going to join the EU. You can be independent in the sense of being autonomous, but you have to be neutral. When, when you've got two great powers, whether it's the U.S. and Russia or um, the U.S. plus Europe and Russia confronting each other, uh, the idea of buffer states, I mean, that's as old as, uh, you know, the, 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 if not history, uh, at least the, the history of buffer states is uh, several centuries old at this point. It's, it's a part of what every international uh, strategist uh, looks at. So Ukraine should be a buffer state. It should be neutral. Uh, that way Putin has no reason to invade and we have no reason to try to push the borders of NATO to a point slightly east of Moscow, which uh, Moscow hasn't been attacked from the east since Genghis Khan. These sanctions will not work to stop the war or slow the war or change the outcome of the war. Now, they absolutely punish the Russian economy. Yep. They punish Russian individuals, consumers, Russian citizens. They're going to have fewer options, uh, more expensive goods. Um, you know, their economy is going to slow down. Unemployment will go up. The ruble is devalued. All those things are true. But they're also true in the United States. We're going to punish Americans far worse than the Russians. Uh, we're already seeing I took a long trip yesterday. Uh, I filled up my car with gas at the end of the trip. It was $76. Inflation's here. Uh, we all see it. Uh, you know, price of gasoline, uh, eggs, milk, butter, groceries at the store, um, rents, electricity, uh, home heating, uh, you know, fuel, uh, you name it. Across the board, inflation's affecting everything. 
Um, and it started uh, really in uh, mid 2021. So here we are uh, almost 2023. So it's been going on for well over a year uh, for the first six or seven months, you know, Jay Powell and for that matter, Janet Yellen were like, yeah, we see it, but it's transitory, transitory. We know that story. Finally, in November 2021, Jay Powell threw in the towel, uh, said, okay, time time to retire the word transitory. Now let's get to work. And they um, started raising interest rates in uh, March 2022. And we're now up to a uh, Fed funds rate of 4%. Uh, they're going to raise them again in December, uh, December 14th by another 50 basis points. We kind of you know, still a little bit away from that, but we know it's coming. The Fed, this is the no drama Fed. They tell you what they're doing in advance. So uh, I always say you don't you don't need a crystal ball to figure out the Fed. You just need to listen to what they're saying and believe them. So they're they're going to do 50 basis points in uh, December. That'll get the um, uh, policy rate of the Fed funds uh, target rate to four and a half percent. But that's from zero. March first, it was zero. So to go from zero to four and a half in less than nine months about eight and a half months that's amazing we haven't seen anything like that since uh, uh paul volcker in in the early 80s now i know rates are not 13 14 percent but um but to go from zero to four and a half i can say in eight months is uh is a shock now what's why is the fed doing this well they they say they want to kill inflation okay but um there are two sources of inflation inflation can come from the supply side um, what's called cost push inflation. Costs go up and they get pushed into um, uh, you know re retail prices and, and consumer prices. Uh, and that is what's happening. That's because of the supply chain breakdown, energy uh, prices, shortages of goods, et cetera. So that's cost push inflation from the supply side. There's another kind of inflation that comes from the demand side. And this is much more psychological. It's when consumers say, you know, they just have it in their heads and maybe from objective data that prices are going up. And so they change the behavior. They say, you know, I was thinking of getting a new washing machine, but uh, I was going to wait six months, but I better buy it now because the price is going to be a lot higher in six months or a car, or, you know, suit of clothes, a dress, uh, furniture, whatever it is, better buy it now because the price is going to go up. It's going to get worse. Inflation's here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. Bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20 year decisions. The 10 year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative place to put money. You can buy gold, you can buy a 10 year treasury note. So what's been true since last summer is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10 year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets. And I start my analysis in 1971. And I don't have to go through all, the, all that data, but that's that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said, no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. 
with the United States and sterling. I think it was four seventy five. It could be off a little bit on that, but you know, it was four four pounds and and change. And as late as World War One, say nineteen thirteen, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to you know, at the time, Bombay, today, Mumbai, you took a purse of the uh, British sovereigns. British sovereign is, is about, uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce, it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even, even today, what are you going to do with a one ounce coin? It's worth, you know, almost $2,000. Uh, you know, you're not going to use that for, to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time. And it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing as Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign? That's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971 when we decouple completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3,000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War One. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold. Um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Whether it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK, or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made four hundred ounce bars. And they said, Don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money. Uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're, they're heavy. They weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve System sold all the banks. Hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and, you know, hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. And it's there. And look on the, look in the assets. And the first line item is gold certificate. And it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that, that 11 billion is actually worth 470 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of 450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet represented by a gold certificate. But it's not the gold. The Treasury has the gold. And by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I'm you know, just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics. 
and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know what, if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they, they hid it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously in the U.S., we still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half. No, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. Uh, if I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it now since 1980. Inflation is coming down, by the way. And uh, having said that, the target is 2%. So he's, he's not there, but he's making progress. Now, Wall Street's saying, you're done. You, you, you did it. Mission accomplished. Inflation is coming down. You got what you want to give it time. Stop raising rates. You're going to kill the economy. But the Fed is saying, well, we actually don't know. We can't untangle it. Yes, inflation is coming down. That's objective. But is it coming down because we're still raising rates? Or is it coming down because we're at the terminal rate? Those are two different things. And right now, and this is what Powell's been saying, the Fed leans to the view that they're not at the terminal rate, that inflation is coming down because they're raising rates. They have not achieved the terminal rate. So Powell and the Fed have said, yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate and then we'll pause. And then if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff. I mean, the Fed's thinking mid 2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street and I'll say markets, not just Wall Street, but the big money in places like uh, the euro dollar futures curve and, and the U.S. Treasury curve, which are highly inverted, are saying, no, you're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause a going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. And you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street, with the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message. Why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. And everyone knows, you know, Volcker became Fed chairman in 1979. He, he stayed on until the um, early to mid 80s. Uh, and he did raise interest rates to 20 percent or very close to it to kill inflation, which went up to 15 percent uh, at the time. But people forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp, but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the, with the uh, pandemic panic. Uh, and then they said, oh, sorry, just kidding. And then, and then uh, they took the ceiling off and then things got back to normal. Now, this was a time when farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building. And one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That I mean, that all happened. So uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker, uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which number one was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, he said, we, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember Powell's not an economist, he's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that, you know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, 
before the battle against inflation is won because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger, and then you do have to destroy the economy as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then, but at the time that was horrific. But Volcker and others have said that was a blunder he never should have done. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. So, so the question is, how does this play out? In my view, Powell probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat, at least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't, but the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, if you want to forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed. You have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest, the unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. You know, as I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. They think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year, there, there are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is it is coming down, but there are two sources of inflation. And it's gonna sound obvious, but you gotta separate them, the supply side and the demand side. Both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Now, and again, this is what my book Sold Out is about, the breakdown of the supply chain, partly related to energy, partly related to the war in Ukraine, partly related to the pandemic panic. Uh, as I explained in the book, it actually predates that. The breakdown started in 2018 with Trump's trade war, and then COVID made it worse, yes. Ukrainian war made it worse, yes. But it, it really started before that. So, of course, prices went up and people were trying to pay whatever they had to to get what they needed and energy prices were a big driver of that so that feeds through as a form of inflation the other kind of inflation is from the demand side so the supply side is called cost push costs go up and they push it onto the consumers the other kind is from the demand side it's called demand pull and basically consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. And so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side, but by the late 70s, 80s in Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, but it hasn't happened yet. But here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. So it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if I'm right, I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. So it, it does tend to depress um, demand, destroy demand and hurt the economy. And then it slows down and then the inflation comes down on its own. That appears to be happening. But Powell hasn't really made the distinction. He's still, he's fighting the last war, I hate to use a cliche, but he's fighting the Volcker war. Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He thinks the battle's not won. He has to get to the terminal rate. In reality, he's probably already there. The future is very positive for gold. Uh, you have the normal vectors, you know, uh, supply is flat. 
it has been for six years. Demand is going up. Central banks have flipped from net sellers to net buyers. That's a big deal. Um, and the retail institutional interest is higher. So that's good. Geopolitical threats don't need to say a lot, you know, from the U.S. perspective, Iran, China, North Korea, Venezuela, Russia, you name it. So that's the vector. But the biggest driver right now is what I referred to a few minutes ago, negative real rates. Because gold, as a form of money, which is how I view it, competes with other interest rate, competes with other instruments, treasury bills, et cetera. Well, if they have high yields and gold has no yield, you want the treasury bills. But if uh, if interest rates have negative yields and gold's just flat, gold looks more attractive. So that's the main driver, and that's going to continue. Everyone's like, well, you know, the gold is up, gold is down. Uh, but when the, well, so what do you mean when you say that? And they're talking about the dollar price of gold. And it's like, okay, so the dollar price of gold is up or down. That's really a cross rate. That's no different than talking about the euro, US dollar exchange rate or, or Australian dollar, US dollar exchange rate. If you think of gold as money, and I do, then the dollar price of gold with gold measured by weight, not as another currency, uh, it is another form of money, but with gold measured by weight, it's a cross exchange rate. When the price goes up, I would say that what's really happening is the dollar is going down. In other words, I think of gold by weight. I, I'm interested, you know, do you have a, uh, do you have a ton? Do you have uh, 50 kilos? Do you have five ounces? Whatever you have as an individual investor, or as a bank, I think of it by weight because when someone says gold's really going up. I said, well, no, the dollar's going down. You need more dollars to purchase a fixed quantity of gold, which means the dollar's worth less. And when people say, gold's really going down, I say, no, the dollar's worth more, and you need fewer dollars to purchase a quantity of gold. You know, when, you, when people talk about price, the first thing they do is they're really talking about dollars. You know, I mean, there's a euro price for gold, but it, the world market is based on dollars. You're privileging the dollar as the numeraire. The numeraire is your counting system. You know, is it yards, inches, feet, whatever? And if you put the dollar first and say gold is in dollars and it's going up or down, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to put gold first by weight. And then if it's worth more, the dollar's going down. If it's worth less, the dollar's going up. And so when you say gold is going up, let's say it went to $2,000 an ounce. It was, oh, the price of gold went up, you know, just went up uh, 10%. Um, well, did it or did the dollar go down? Uh, the way I would phrase it is, you know, it used to be $1,800 to get an ounce of gold. Now it's $2,000 to get an ounce of gold or, you know, your dollar got you one eighteen hundredth of an ounce. Today, it only gets you one two thousandth of an ounce. Uh, in other words, gold didn't do anything. It's a metal. It's an element, atomic number 79. What happened was the, the dollar got stronger. So a stronger dollar is a lower dollar price for gold and a weaker dollar is a higher dollar price for gold. So when people talk about gold going up, what they're really talking about is the dollar going down. We have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year, records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously, the theories are that are, that are that they are Russia and China. Now, China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything, but Switzerland's down a thousand tons. The U.S. was down a thousand tons after losing, uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons, or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now, it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one, literally one month, their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons. Well, you know the market. You, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month, not, not one country in one order. But they had it all along, but they decided to reveal it, put it on their balance sheet. So uh, Americans don't seem to like gold. I'm not sure Canadians feel much differently or others around the world, uh, but central banks sure do. And I think that tells you something. 
There's huge demand for dollars all over the world, not because of the currency, but because of collateral, because of treasury bills. Banks need treasury bills to pledge as collateral for derivatives. It's the best collateral in the world. Um, and if you don't have it, you're not going to be able to leverage your balance sheet as much as you would like. You're not going to be as profitable. You're not going to be able to support lending and investing, which is what banks in theory are supposed to do. So to support the bloat of balance sheets and to support the derivatives, you need collateral. And the better the collateral, the more leverage you can have. The best collateral in the world is a treasury bill. And so there's a mad scramble for treasury bills, which means there's a mad scramble for dollars to buy treasury bills. And that is coming from European banks, it's coming from Chinese banks um, and banks around the world, but primarily European and Chinese. And that's not going away. So it's, it's, it's funny to hear people, where people think it's funny to hear anyone talk about a dollar collateral shortage, like, hey, haven't you flooded the world with dollars? Hasn't the Fed printed $9 trillion? And the answer is they have. But that's not the measure. It's, it's, a, it's a high multiple of that. It's the dollar value of all the collateral. Because in the repo markets, you know, I pledge the collateral to you, and then you pledge it to somebody else, one of our colleagues, and then she pledges it to somebody else, et cetera. That collateral gets pledged 50 times and supports not one dollar a balance sheet but fifty dollars a balance sheet for a dollar of collateral and so you restrict the collateral you're restricting the balance sheet the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight but as a payment currency there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency anything can be a payment currency if i want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that then it's a it's a currency so all of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. I can give you 20 reasons why the dollar should go down, but I'll give you one big reason why it won't, which is the demand for collateral. And so that's keeping the dollar constant, which is keeping the dollar price of gold constant because gold doesn't change and the dollar's not changing. Now that'll break um, and that'll break in favor of gold, meaning the dollar will get a lot weaker. It'll have to, but it's going to take a few months at least because the U.S. economy has to get weaker, which it is. The Fed will figure this out maybe by September, ne next September. Um, and uh, then they'll ease a little bit and they'll try to weaken the dollar to try to give the U.S. economy a boost, but we're not there yet. So it's going to be, now that doesn't mean the price of gold is going down a lot. I'm just saying it's not going to go up a lot. It's going to chug along kind of sideways, but when it breaks, it's going to break big to the upside because the dollar is going to go to the downside, but that's probably at least um, still a few months away, maybe longer.